Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Max. And I'm Austin. And today is our 100th, 100th episode. Yay. Wow. We did it. We, we made it 100 episodes without killing each other. We've embarrassed ourselves 100 times. All for your amusement. I hope you appreciate Actually, it. Actually, way more than 100 times. Oh, yeah. I'll, we had to practice to really do it well. <laughs> yeah, we don't talk about the lost episodes, though. <laughs> Because if you think what we're doing now is bad, <laughs> Jesus. Oh, man. Are you telling me, Max, people aren't like really, really like just anticipating that uh, <laughs> that hidden uh, release the spectator <laughs> battle, cut <laughs> battle uh, battleship Earth? What it was it called? Battlefield battle Earth. Royale. Battlefield Earth. <laughs> Battlefield Earth. <laughs> the one where you wanted to die the entire time. <laughs> yes. I can, can't even remember what it's called. Uh, it's at the very least, it's given us a lot of good memories, this podcast. Um, but speaking of good things, the movie we're doing today for our 100th episode, Yo Jimbo, is nothing but good things, which is going to make it a bit challenging to talk about, but I think we're going to be able to power through it anyway. Yeah, as is the case with a lot of big auteur filmmakers when we tackle them for the first time, we're very scared. We're very scared to do it. Uh, <laughs> um, but in the case of Akira Kurosawa, um, he is a particularly challenging filmmaker to tackle because uh, I just think... I think we don't appreciate how challenging it really is to have a productive conversation about his films. And a lot of it has to do with the transnational nature of his movies. Um, it also has to do with the fact that they're straddling not only multiple countries um, and multiple cultures, but also um, our conceptions of like, you know, broad entertainment and high art. Um, Kurosawa is someone who is uh, in equal terms been both equated with like, 1950s original wave of auteur cinema um, with stuff like Rashman, um, but also with, you know, really broad uh, entertainment action films like Seven Samurai and, of course, Yo Jimbo. Um, so he really has like a, he, he has a very like broad um, range that he goes through while doing things that are very much in the same genre. And it's, as you, we were discussing this a bit before recording, but as you said before, it's also going to be a bit challenging because some of the genres that are commonly associated that he inspired or drew from, we have not covered on the yes. Spectator Film Podcast yes. before. We, have, we haven't done a Western yet. Um, we haven't done, like, well, we've done gangster movies. I think this movie draws a little bit from gangster movies. We've done a Yakuza movie, which this movie is also related to, but it was one of our first episodes and it was terrible. We <laughs> definitely didn't do justice to Tokyo Drifter. Very that movie's true. awesome. Um, but... Uh, and, and then, of course, there's the other direction, too. We haven't talked about any spaghetti westerns. And, of course, we're going to be talking about during this episode this movie's relationship to Sergio Leone and his films, obviously. Um, but, I mean, that's just one example of this movie's sort of lineage and its impact. I mean, I think it's it sort of had an influence on all sorts of genre movies um, all across the world, really. Um, so it's uh, this is one of the biggest movies we've done, I think, um, without a doubt, and I just think it's going to be a really challenging episode, especially because we haven't talked about those other things yet, so we don't really have the context for it. But we'll we'll do our best. Yes. I, if I can just talk about, because this is one of those film one-on-one -on -one movies, and I'm not trying to say that in a derogatory term. Well, it is. You're yes. right. Yeah. It's one of those movies that you are going to see a lot if you take courses related to film. This or some other Kurosawa movie. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Hidden Fortress is one that I've also seen. Numerous times. Seven Samurai once in a class, but I've seen this the most times in the most film classes. Sure. And unlike a lot of films that were shoved down my throat during those times, uh, this is one of the ones that I can revisit any number of times and still get a huge amount of enjoyment out of it. And I think that's changed over the years. Uh, for better or for worse? Um, For neutral, I would say. Okay. I, I appreciate it in different ways. Sure. Every time I watch it and as I get older. Because when I first watched it, I want to say I was like 19, and I think I appreciated it more on how unexpectedly funny it was yeah, and how accessible it was in that way. And also, like, I was a gigantic weeb, so I appreciated <laughs> the samurai coolly killing people. Yeah, you get to see where this type of, like, Japanese stylized violence kind of has an origin point. Yes. Know? Yeah. And Kurosawa had a huge impact on that in general, but I'll get into that later. But as I got older, it's more of just the impact it had on filmmakers like Sergio Leone and other films and staples that I loved. And as I get even older watching it now, I can appreciate it 
as a critique of American colonialism and capitalism and just the changing of Japanese culture as I learned more about history. And I think this movie has so much to give, and that's why I thoroughly enjoy it as much as I do. Yeah, I, I think that is one of the primary characteristics of Kurosawa's best movies is that when they become a nexus of so many overlapping and like contradictory elements, whether it's like the U.S., you know, stylistic and formal qualities of U.S. storytelling and filmmaking combined with Japanese storytelling and filmmaking or, you know, high genres or low genres, um, different uh, genres within that conversation as well, whether it's like Yakuza and the Western being combined in some way. Like, he's constantly taking all these elements and then offering them back to us in a way that feels totally organic. Uh, it has a lot of invention and um, I think just requires a lot of vision to pull off. And I think that's that ultimately is the glue that sticks all of this stuff together is he has such a powerful vision for all his films that makes them really exciting to return to uh, time and again. Oh, this is my pick, by the way. <laughs> yes. I should mention. Um, I, I just, I guess, I don't know why I picked this movie, Max. I think it was just time that I wanted to do a Kurosawa movie. I think I chose unintentionally a very challenging Kurosawa movie. Yeah, this wasn't like an intentional, like, oh, we have to do a big movie for our 100th episode. It just ended up this way. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if I, in retrospect, maybe the best, for our purposes of the show at least, the best introduction to Kurosawa might have been Drunken Angel because it has a more straightforward presentation of the, a lot of the same themes. It's also a Yakuza movie. Um, it's his first collaboration with Toshiro Mifune. Um, but the thing that really makes this movie better than Drunken Angel, in my opinion, is that really interesting sense of humor and the way that plays in with its sense of politics, which Drunken Angel doesn't have quite a developed sense of. Um, so I do think this movie's better and it's going to have more to offer us. Um, before before we jump into the commentary track, unless do you have anything else? No, I coming on. Let's go ahead. So I have a quote, uh, two quotes actually, from a book called "The Samurai Films of Akira Kurosawa" by a man named David Desser, and I would recommend this book to anyone who's really interested in Kurosawa's movies. Um, his samurai films are otherwise, um, because I think they're all related in, in different and interesting ways. Um, but this book is really interesting. Um, it was published in the 80s, and it uses a lot of structuralist language. So if you're not comfortable with that, maybe it might be a little bit intimidating. But I still think it's very rewarding. And uh, the quotes I'm going to be reading from are things that sort of discuss how genre films like this relate to the, the nation in which they originate, relate to that nation's sense of selfhood and self of its uh, sense of its own history. Um, and David Desser writes that the obsolescence of the samurai as a warrior class during the Tokugawa era is one of the key structural underpinnings of the samurai film. Filmmakers' seeming unwillingness to situate their samurai dramas in the more violent Momoyama or Muromachi period indicates the function the samurai genre fulfills to the Japanese mind. The audience must confront at every moment the film is on screen both the obsolescence and eventual destruction of the way of life which the hero is a part. It puts the hero of the film in a curious position of being unable to succeed no matter what course of action he takes. And then on the next page he continues, attention exists because the samurai warrior is born into a rigid society that extends back over a thousand years, but is soon doomed to extinction. The samurai class will be abolished, and in the wake of World War II, it will leave his code to ruination. The frontier becomes a psychological one of a nation trying to hold back the inevitable, of a heroic but ultimately futile struggle to preserve a way of life that will disappear and give rise not just to a new civilization, but one which will, in many instances, repudiate its forebears. So I think that's very much at the you know forefront of this movie's subtext and getting to what you're talking about, that critique of capitalism. Uh, it's no you know, coincidence that Kurosawa would place this movie in the Tokugawa era um, right towards the start of the Meiji Restoration, a uh, very self-conscious yes, the attempt to change Japan's you know, culture and society and that post-war economic miracle. Yes. The, they're very related. And also that quote uh, drives home how similar this is to the structure of an American Western film. Sure. And how accessible it is to Western audiences because of that. And I mean, we've talked about this off mic, but like that's its own sophisticated thorny conversation. A lot of people talk about how the Western influenced Kurosawa. We might argue that it's the other way around more so. Yes. Um, but 
they, I think the comparison is fruitful, especially for us in the U.S. Um, definitely, you can make the same sort of general argument that David Dester is talking about in our own way for our relationship to our uh, sort of mythologization of like, you know, westward expansion, manifest destiny in the old west. Um, so it's two different, um, it's a similar mechanism that produces different results because it's different countries and different cultures. Um, but that's just sort of a good place to start with our conversation of this movie because it's going to take those ideas and bring them in totally new and interesting directions. Yeah, but if you don't have anything else to say, I say we yo Jim go ahead and start this commentary. Wow, you're not going to credit me for that joke? No, nope. I was supposed to say that. Let's go. <laughs> Criterion Collection. Uh, the That's one. the edition we're watching, by the way. Yes. Very, very nice edition. Uh, I have never had anything bad to say about Criterion. Nope, never once. Uh, you're right, though. This is a very nice edition. And it has a lovely commentary track by the recently deceased Stephen Prince. Oh, you didn't tell me. <laughs> R.I.P. I was enjoying that, watching that. I don't know. Yeah. Rest in peace. That was a very good commentary. And track. he's got a really great book um, called The Warrior's Camera, the cinema of Akira Kurosawa, that we're going to shout out here. Because uh, we may or may not be thrown in some quotes from that book. Through Ooh. this commentary track. It is a great book, not just about um, Kurosawa's samurai films, but all of his films. And he does a really good job of situating them in their context and, and bringing some other critical terminology to them. But here we are with the famous opening title sequence of Yojimbo. And immediately this movie is beautiful. Immediately. It grabs your attention and just like, uh. You know what it is, Max? It's that Kurosawa is such a strong grasp of just like filmmaking fundamentals where in the opening shot, he's just so good at using that telephoto lens to compress the space and then make Tashiro Mifune's sort of silhouette just appear massive yeah, against the mountain. He's range. literally greater than the mountains. Yes. Um, and it communicates everything you need to know about his stature. And uh, it fortunately Tashiro Mifune is going to live up to that introduction in his performance here. I think it's a great performance. Um, but I, I just think it's interesting how immediately this movie is visually compelling. Um, you know, Kurosawa never wastes any time with that. And it's really exciting. Um, but yeah. Uh, Sorry, it is breathtaking, this yeah. opening sequence. And he's a great physical actor too. He's not just like, it's not just line delivery, but it's just like the, this entire opening text crawl is without dialogue and... A good score, but not like that's not carrying the weight. It's just like his casual and powerful physical performance is really carrying. See, I do really role. like the score. I think the score is very bizarre too, and we're gonna get into oh, that. Oh, the score in moments in this movie overall, I would say, does a lot of heavy lifting for some parts, but yeah. like, I don't think it's it's not the primary focus of this scene. Um, but no, the score later on in this movie does a lot of great work. Yeah. And it also does like a lot of yeah, good moments of pointing out when things are supposed to be comedic, when they might like be horrific to an audience at, at the time. Yes. Uh, we're going to point out a lot of different moments where it's like even what we might call Mickey mousing, <laughs> where um, it is synchronizing with the visuals of the film in a way that appears cartoonish and is kind of alienating. <laughs> It's certainly not a decision you would make if you're scoring a movie trying to make your audience really like just drawn into the film. It definitely, you know, draws attention to the fact that it's like artifice in a film. Um, but yes, uh I think this is a really interesting moment in the in the movie because we are having our introduction here to to Shir Mifune, um, to Sanjuro, as he's named in this film, which is not his real name. Um, he doesn't really have a real name. He's the original man with no name um, before Clint Eastwood. But not only does he not have a name, he doesn't really have a history or a position in this society. He is definitely what you would call a ronin, right? So this period in Japanese history, Tokugawa era, is a period mostly very peaceful. And um, the interesting thing about making samurai films during this period is that a lot of them lost their occupations, or at least they stopped becoming samurai as you might expect them to be as like, you know, straight up warriors. Some of them became like bureaucrats. They took administrative positions. Um, and then 
still others became Ronin. So they just started wandering. They're just kind of like dudes hanging around, right? People, people for killers for hire, basically. Killers are just like Yojimbos, which yes. of course that word means bodyguard. We uh, yeah, I don't know. From what I've understood about Japanese here history, that's that's more of a noble <laughs> term than they ever had. But uh, my point is just that like they are now at this point in history a class that has been sort of severed from their historical roots in Japan up until this point. And that's why it's interesting to look at this uh, time frame in reference to the, you know, post-war economic miracle. Because it is something that's, you know, the Meiji Restoration is going to be like an economic, you know, frontier. We're going to use that term, economic frontier um, for Japanese culture. And it's going to be the start of what really ends the uh, lifestyle of the samurai in Japan. So once again... Characters looking like sort of down the barrel of the gun at their own extinction. Um, but Just the, like these farmers here. Yes. We, we see in the opening scene, we have the son run away to the city to try to make money as a Yojimbo. And the father is lamenting the death of farmers and how big, yeah, big business almost. The sake brewer is trading silk now. Yeah. And it's ruining everybody else's lives. And the farmers aren't making any money off of their land anymore. Yeah, it's sort of the the change from like an agrarian society to an industrial society. One that trades in more like elastic commodities rather than like necessities. Yes. And with those commodities comes like the creation of markets and like the artificial creation of markets. Um, and then markets become sort of like their own end and it becomes like an Ouroboros gets out of control when you can make money off of a market. Why would you not just fabricate that market to exist in the first place? If you have an agrarian society, you're probably running your society in a way that's more closely related to just fulfilling needs rather than fulfilling like market requirements. Um, because you don't have to make as much money in order to survive. But yes, here we have, uh, Sanjuro arriving in this town. And like we said, he's a ronin. The interesting thing, though, about his introduction that we sort of skipped over is the way he throws that stick in the air. I think it's a really great moment because it hammers home a, a specific type of like absurdist tone that is going to really carry the comedy through in this movie. It's not just that he's a masterless ronin. He's kind of like an of absurdist comedy. masterless ronin. Speaking of absurd comedy. Yes, the we doggy. Have, we have this good dog <laughs> carrying a fucking human hand. If you have the um, Criterion Edition, I suggest you watch the making of documentary bit, which is great. But they <laughs> they talk to the guy who like had to go find that dog, and it's a very cute, funny story. He had to like go convince this family, like, hey, can I have your dog for this movie? He had to like hang out with it and become his friend. <laughs> it's very funny i would watch a movie about that guy trying yeah. to do that yeah i was saying that beforehand that like i want to see that documentary or yeah. that like <laughs> weird movie about that guy befriending the dog to be in one scene of yojimbo <laughs> yeah now um that's another moment too where the score really picks up and it becomes kind of like almost vaguely like scooby-doo-ish in some ways and i don't mean that as an insult i just mean like how could Scooby-Doo ever be an insult? So. Well, I think people would assume that, like, oh, this is a film one-on-one movie. If you talk about Scooby-Doo, a lot of the time they would use library music where it sounds like, oh, is this stock music? This sounds kind of, like, cheap. Yeah. Or in some ways, like, it draws attention to itself. But that's part of the point of this movie and something I wanted to mention in reference to, you know, Sanjuro throwing that stick up in the air and just following whichever direction it points him in. Um, it's not only, like, an absurdist sort of, like, Samuel Beckett-esque, waiting for Godot-esque um, take on this character where he's just totally aimless and drifting. Um, but it's also kind of like drawing attention to the fact, because he's so aimless, that he's kind of just like an abstract, imaginary figure. Like, he, yeah. like I think the movie really draws attention to the fact that, like, Sanjuro is Kurosawa's, like, emissary into this world and he's going to manipulate the drama and the scenarios and the characters in this town much in the way that like a director might manipulate a scenario they're writing um or directing through like uh, like an authorial hand you know i think the the author's hand and sanjuro's hand so like overlap in this movie and they do so in a very self-conscious and deliberate way 
and again, I think the music being kind of like, you know, drawing attention to itself um, in that sort of Scooby-Doo-esque way sometimes really aids that. Sorry, you keep bringing up Scooby-Doo. It reminds me of a, a classic bit Eddie Izzard has where she talks about how Scooby-Doo is the height of American culture. And <laughs> what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> because uh, she's talking about how Scooby-Doo does something that's very hard to do in media, which is make us root for people who are utter cowards. And <laughs> everybody, everybody across every nation just loves Scooby-Doo. It's, it's a lovable show. So she says that's the height of American culture. And I'm inclined to agree with her <laughs> because you know what, at the end of the day, we can talk about Velma being the smart one there. Shaggy and Scooby are the smartest ones. Yeah. Cause they're like, I don't want to fucking deal with this. I just want to eat and be like, relax and hang out with my dog. Which is honestly the dream. Yeah. <laughs> you know what, Max? That's reminding me of another really great movie we got to do on the show sometime called The Americanization of Emily. Um, it stars uh, Julie Andrews um, and James Garner. I think it's James Garner often called it his favorite film he ever made in his career. But it's written by Patty Chayefsky. And I think that is one of the funniest takes on cowardice I've ever seen. <laughs> With a character trying to justify their their cowardice is like this like that really it's the only moral right thing to do. That movie's great. That's a that's a blanket recommendation for the Americanization of Emily. Check that out. Coming up soon on the Spectator Film Podcast. Perhaps. Patty Chayefsky, great writer. We could totally do one of his movies. I know you can't pay. We are introduced to the restaurant owner who is the only person with a conscience left in this town, apparently. He is kind of Sanjuro's conscious. Yeah. Right? Sanjuro, we should explain this. Like, from even the introduction, we talk about the absurdist, sort of aimless nature of Sanjuro. Um, the other way in which Sanjuro, in, in the way he's introduced as a character, is a real departure from, like, film samurais previously to this, is uh, he appears a lot more unkempt and has uh, less scruples um, about getting involved with this evil, dastardly town, uh, much more so than perhaps other samurai films previously. He's our protagonist, and he does not give a fuck about the Bushido Code. He does not care at all. Um, and he's... It's not like, oh... It's not even in a scoundrelly way. It's just like society doesn't abide by it anymore, so why should he? And he's so martially above everybody else that it, it is matter. in an absurdist way yeah one of the things we can talk about with that absurdism is how growing up uh one of akurosawa's first literary like loves that he was obsessed with was dostoevsky and i do think sanjuro has an echo of that dostoevsky in like kind of like absurdist individual who's casting judgment on the society around them um it's you know except for the fact that yojimbo doesn't really articulate his judgments on everyone so much as he just decides he's going to take action against them. You know, he, he's kind of a quiet individual, but he will fuck up the entire town simply because he thinks he's justified to do so. And because it amuses him. That's like one of the big reasons he's here, even more so than money. Um, and there's other reasons why, you know, you might watch this movie and think like, oh, it, he's motivated by money at first. We'll point out why there's a little bit more to it than that. But it is an absurdist sense of like existential well, yeah. individualism guiding him. And even though the the currencies are foreign to not even just us as Westerners, but like people who weren't alive during the Tokugawa period. Yeah. But we get a sense of reference later that he's getting paid like 20 times more than the other people that <laughs> he's just asking for absurd amounts of money. He like doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, we just talked over that amazing framing um, with the sort of like, it's almost like a triptych with the introduction of pig boy. <laughs> um, All three of one of the, the, one of the like main rivals in this, like they're run by three brothers, and all of them are named after whatever zodiac year they were yes. born in. And Although, wasn't this character the thing was that he was born like right on New Year's? No, that's the older brother who runs oh. the entire thing. Oh, that's uh, Tatsuya Nakadai. Yes, 
Tatsuya uh, Nakadai, who's fucking awesome. Oh, not the no, not the gun guy. Oh, okay. No, uh, the old the eldest brother who's like in charge of everything. Okay, the, all yeah. three of those are brothers. That guy was born like conceived in the year of the cow and then born in the year of the dragon. Yeah. Um which is a weird thing. And then yeah, he's he was born in the year of the boar and his brother was what? Born in the year of the the rabbit or something like that. He has the face of a rabbit but like is evil underneath. By the way, just to talk about that framing again and then how it relates. Look at how amazingly um and with such efficiency Kurosawa is able to like just pivot throughout this in through these like these sort of um uh, uh these windows, right? And just establish everything throughout this town. Um and we're getting a classic like frame within a frame element here. I think that definitely plays into like the deliberately um uh, meta self-aware element of this movie um where our characters are going to play the role of storyteller in some ways but also max i want to i want to posit a little theory here some people have talked about this innkeeper we compared him to sanjiro's conscious but some people have compared him to a figure specific to japanese cinema from the silent era called a benchy where a benchy is basically someone who would in a I don't want to compare it to Rocky Horror, really, but that might be a good comparison where they're like basically acting out and performing the the content of the film in front of the audience as well. Okay. And a good Benchy could be as just as much of a draw for an audience as the film itself. So this very interesting thing in Japan where they draw attention to the artifice of the movie by also having someone narrate and perform it in front of the audience. And some people have compared this innkeeper to that, but also... This movie, Max, I don't think people would notice necessarily that it was maybe like an emotional movie. Does it strike you as like very emotional? Does this feel like a personal movie to Kurosawa? It's hard to say because first, like if you were to say that, like I would say for even like the first half or even two thirds of the movie, I would call you crazy. But it like it packs a lot of emotion into that last like half or third of the film. Yeah. Sanjiro gets a little bit involved. Yes. In this once Sanjiro stops being like an absurdist, just like I'm above all of you fucking insane morons. Yeah. And gets more emotional, emotionally invested in the town. I I would say so that you can see Kurosawa was personal yeah, stake and emotional sense in the movie, but it, it's interesting. Like, how little this movie takes itself seriously for so long and still yeah. manages to be a very serious film. Yeah. And you don't necessarily equate that right away with like emotional involvement on part of like the filmmaker. However, yes. the reason I ask you that is because one of the biographical details I know about Kurosawa is, um, you know, he had a great, he was very influenced by his brother who died very young and his brother was a Benchy. His brother apparently was very good at it too. Um, he really looked up to his brother and we know based on his like, you know, autobiography and just his writings, like when he grew up, he would always think of like different individuals in his life on kind of like heroic terms from Japanese history. And I think maybe he sort of viewed his brother in that way as well. And, you know, seeing people compare that innkeeper character to the Benshi and then seeing them sort of team up with Sanjuro here. Part of me wonders if that is just like an echo of a sort of emotional involvement, because I do think by the end of the movie, one thing that's really clear about Kurosawa's opinion on like Japan and the state of Japan when this movie was coming out is that he doesn't like this like colonial direction and he wants people to sort of he wants the heroic history of Japan to sort of triumph over this uh, capitalism that's coming to consume everything. You know, he wants Sanjuro to come in with his sword and cut down all these evil, evil capitalists, you know? And part of me wonders again, maybe, I mean, this movie is definitely wish fulfillment in that sense, but also maybe that's an example of emotional involvement on his part. If that innkeeper character is maybe something you could connect to his brother. And I well. also think it's like a slight acknowledgement of the fact that it's like, listen, I know I'm making movies for a broad audience in order to make money in the same system, but like, yeah, I can only do that for so long before it's going to like destroy me as well. If you want to read Kurosawa into this sure. personally. And you know what, Max, that is definitely not the only time this movie um, very self-consciously does that in reference to the film industry. We're going to see another actor pop up later on. If you've seen this movie before, you might know who we're talking about. 
And uh, that that scene, I think, Max, is very deliberately and very thinly veiled uh, a comment on like the forces of economics in the film industry itself in Japan. So I do I think you know that type of reflection on Kurosawa's own life in this movie, uh, while maybe not readily apparent because of how cool and kind of like nihilistic the comedy is in this, I think you could find it if you wanted to. Also, we just talked over a great line. Um, There's no cure for fools. Not just that, but where like, you know, like they're saying like, oh, Sanjuro, how are you going to get respect in this town? It's like, oh, you'd have to like kill us or something. It's like, okay, but it hurt. <laughs> it would hurt. So three bodies down. We just had our first combat. Split second. Samurai kills them all instantly. Yeah. And I think the combat, too, is just another example of how interestingly this entire movie is shot. Um, we could probably say it in every scene. Kurosawa's use of the, like, cinemascope frame in this film is fucking fantastic. Uh, you may see a lot of movies from this time, you know, a lot of directors start to use the cinemascope frame, but they wouldn't be as good with it right away because it was sort of an innovation that came about in a, in a way to kind of compete with television. You know, we're going to make these films wider. We're going to make them bigger. Kurosawa never has a problem uh, filling up the frame and always making it really interesting. Um, I mean, this, this movie is just fascinating to look at. But the reason I bring that up in reference to the combat is uh, when you watch other samurai films, it really hammers home, like, how fucking visually different this movie is to them. Uh, especially in terms of, like, the way it organizes space off screen and the way it sort of cuts around different axes on the action. Um, I do not know the name of them off the top of my head, Max, but do you know the horizontal Japanese like illustrative scrolls? Oh yes, 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 yes. I get the impression that other, you know, samurai films before this one had a tendency to sort of mimic that, that sort of graphical style which is not an evaluation. I think there's certainly something really worthwhile in doing that and trying to capture that in film. Um, but it does lead to like a kind of uniformity in how they present action because it's always going to be in more horizontal terms. I'm thinking specifically of uh, another trilogy of samurai films, um, the Musashi Miyamoto trilogy, uh, Samurai Trilogy, um, also starring uh, Toshiro Mifune. And those are also great films, but they're definitely their take on filming action is very different than this. This movie has a lot more to do with depth and this movie is a lot more willing to cut around different settings and scenes um, across different axes. And we're slowly learning there is no good side in this conflict. <laughs> They're all fucking cheats and cowards and idiots. Yes. On both sides. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, you saying that, there's a few ways we could branch off comments from your, you pointing that out. But maybe the first one to bring up is that a lot of people talk about how this movie was based on a Dashiell Hammett novel called Red Harvest, which is about his continental op character going to a town called Personville and then pitting the two sort of uh, evil sort of gang groups against one another to destroy each other in the town. However... While that novel is fucking amazing, that's one of my favorite books, by the way. Red Harvest is an amazing book. Um, oh, I, I fucking <laughs> love Toshiro Mifune. Uh, he's so fucking good in this. We're going to talk about his performance soon. But um, while that novel is really amazing, Kurosawa said he didn't read it, and I totally believe him. Uh, and another, another reason why I believe him and why, you know, even though he would draw, uh, would draw a lot of inspiration from gangster films and stuff and uh, other Western sources for his filmmaking... I think the, if I'm, if I remember correctly, I think the argument that it was based on Red Harvest was something originally lodged by Sergio Leone uh, and the producers of A Fistful of Dollars during the lawsuit, where they oh, were saying, yeah. oh, that's based on Red Harvest. Yojimbo is based on Red Harvest. We're actually just adapting Red Harvest as well, not Yojimbo. That was part of their legal argument. And I believe that lawsuit eventually uh, got an out-of-court settlement with Toho, but it was uh, it was something else. Uh, 
And now that we've brought it up, do you have any like strong opinions about, um, you know, a fistful of dollars or the Man with No Name trilogy at large? I think I I had three distinct phases with them. Um, I really loved them the first time I saw them. Um, then there was the segment where I kind of discovered how much <laughs> a fistful of dollars was just kind of taking the almost same structure as this and in a very youthful and simplistic view i'm just like oh he's look a, that he's a hack <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have any original ideas um and I, I think i've come full circle now to i really appreciate him as a filmmaker and what he contributed they're both good yes and you would hope that you Por, know por que no los dos at yes the end of the exactly day. exactly i'm glad that we have two distinct filmmakers who made Similar style stories, but in very distinct and very well done. It's like, ways. oh God, Sergio Leone was inspired. Yes, God forbid. Um, you know, obviously, maybe they could have given some credit <laughs> to yeah. them or something. Um, but also, like, you know, I I think it's great that they did that, just from a creative standpoint. That being said, and I, it's not dumbed down. It's not like it, no, it's a different. It's not like a approach. hidden fortress situation with Star Wars, where it's yes. like let, let's dumb this down where to the point it, where it, anybody yeah, yeah. can understand it. It becomes the like mascot of fucking Reaganite cinema yeah. to destroy the minds of, of everyone our age in the U.S. Um, God, to Mafune, your performance is amazing. Uh, <laughs> That's gonna his, be that's gonna be eighty percent of our commentary. His, track, just everything way. he does with his eyes is so good. He, there's just so much sarcasm dripping from every single fucking thing. Like he I does. said, his physical acting and just his facial acting, like because he he talks like he's not like the man with no name who like barely talks, but like he's he carries a lot of his performance with just his facial features, which is yeah. Great. Like I mean, he he is not verbose, but he's always communicating, mm-hmm. and he's very playful. Clint Eastwood is not playful. Yeah, that's why I like him a lot better than, like, I was going to say, because you brought up Sergio Leone in yeah, particular, but fucking Clint Eastwood can be a very good actor, but one, I don't like him as a person, and two, sometimes I do find the man with no name, like, irritating and how yeah. fucking cool he is. Yeah, there is more of a straightforward nature to that character, to the point where, like, I do prefer for a few dollars more um, to a fistful of dollars because I, in those movies, I really like Lee Van Cleef more. He's definitely my favorite performance uh, of those movies. Um, I also think the good, the bad and the ugly is a bit more fun than the rest of those. Yeah. The good, the bad, the ugly is also great. Um, Also, if you want to watch a weird fucking uh, remake of that, go watch the good, the bad and the weird. It's, it's something. It's (laughs) It's <laughs> not what you would expect from that kind of movie, but it's Speaking a lot of Speaking of weird, who's this guy running away? Burr, burr. Max, this is the guy I was talking about earlier when I said there would be another meta element to this. Now, what's happening in front of us right now? If you're not watching it with us, Yojimbo Sanjuro, we can call him either one. They both work. Um, he has aligned himself with the first gang he's going to manipulate, and he fucking fleeced them for a shitload of money. And he became the new top dog. He became their top free agent. 25 times what their other top guy is going <laughs> to is paid at the moment. Yes. And we just saw their other top guy, played by Susumu Fujita, running away. Yeah. And he's just like, <laughs> bye bye. Yeah, man, you do you. Yes, because <laughs> Sanjuro makes eye contact with him as he's running away. And I like to think that these guys just know that, like, these gangs are fucking stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, I'm not dying for these assholes. So Susumu, he sort of gives him a look and he's just like, I'm running away. And he just <laughs> he gives smiles him a look back. He's wait. like, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it, man. <laughs> I get you. <laughs> it's very funny. But Max, the meta element of that relates to the nature of these two actors. Because Susumu Fujita, he was Kurosawa's first leading man in his very awesome uh, film debut, uh, Sanshiro Sugata. Um, and that movie's great. And, Again, he was Kurosawa's first leading man, only he would soon be supplanted years later by Toshiro Mifune. And I think you can definitely read that element. And the weird, absurd, abrupt departure, I think, helps highlight this. Like, why the fuck is that guy in the movie? When you focus about it, it's like, oh, the meaning really lies in that like self-aware history that they have in Kurosawa's career. Toshiro Mifune supplants him as the big money-making actor, uh. right? 
and uh, it becomes a sort of like parallel to the economics of filmmaking throughout Kurosawa's directing career. This one guy got replaced. Now Mifune is the big sexy samurai. And he is sexy. Look at him. I will say this. I totally understand the, <laughs> the nonstop thirst parade for Toshiro Mifune on film Twitter. I get it. Yeah. People cannot stop themselves. <laughs> and I understand. I understand, guys. There's a lot of things on thirst Twitter, like, or just actors in general. Like that, that like solid two year pe- yeah, period where the internet was thirsting after Benedict Cumberbatch. I never got oh, that. Jesus but. fucking Christ. <laughs> to quote one of my favorite YouTube videos, anything unique can be sexy. Just look at Benedict Cumberbatch. It's not that he was sexy. He's just, we had never seen anything that looked quite like him before and we were confused. No, they hadn't seen something quite like him. They were bound to be confused. God damn it. Don't bring up that gentleman here. (laughs) So, Max, we were just talking about the meta elements of this movie. This is also another really big moment in that where it's like, oh, my gosh, what has Sanjuro done? He's taken the role of director, and now he's guided these two gangs against each other by manipulating the characters, right? So it's the hand of the author uh, working through Sanjuro to force this kind of awkward and funny battle in the street where neither gang actually wants to fight one another because they're cowards and fucking ridiculous. And of course, the really meta element is how uh, Sanjuro has kind of joined us, the audience, on this giant tower to just watch the action play out with us. God, look at the use of this framing. It's so good. It's so good. Now, Max, if I remember correctly, one of the other comments made in the Stephen Prince commentary track that I found kind of interesting um, was he he was relating a comment made by, I think, Masahiro Shinoda or maybe Nagisa Oshima, one of those two sort of newer wave uh, Japanese filmmakers on that moment when Sanjuro climbs into the tower. And they talk, the comment they made was how They were criticizing Kurosawa and having that moment be emblematic of his filmmaking in the sense where, like, Kurosawa doesn't take a political stand on what's happening in the country. He just kind of, like, sits back and observes. I don't know if I really agree with that in any sense. No. I think this film, even on its own, pretty definitively says otherwise. Um, I I don't think this movie offers, like, a viable political solution. But the opinion of this movie is that, like, all these people just need to be destroyed. I think that's a pretty, <laughs> like, radical conclusion to arrive at when, when we say there's no compromise whatsoever. But it's also, it doesn't revel in that, which would be very easy. It doesn't, like, revel in its own nihilism, which can co- become across as, like, really annoying and pretentious. Well, I think Sanjuro does at the beginning. He revels in what he's doing. He really enjoys it. Well, he revels in the fact that he's above it all, but once he's dragged back down to everybody's level, it's not a glorious thing. It's like, yes, everybody on both sides has to die, but like, look at all the fucking misery. This is rot. This is, this was not a good thing at all. I think by the end of the movie though, uh, Sanjuro still has his sense of humor intact. Somehow, despite getting the shit beat out of him for days on end (laughs) to near death, but that that comes much later, and we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Ooh, the inspector's got a swank palanquin. I didn't know there was a Japanese word for swank. I was about to ask, like, where do you think this ranks among the, some of the other Japanese movies we've done? But, like, it's it's not even. What are the other Japanese movies we've done in the show? Um, off the top of my head, Tokyo Drifter, Battle Royale, um, Princess Mononoke, and <laughs> Destroy All Monsters. That's it? 
that's those are the ones I can think of off the top of my Tetsuo. head. Tetsuo. Tetsuo the Iron Man, yes. Tetsuo is better than this. <laughs> I, I Tetsuo do, is one of the best movies ever made. I do love Tetsuo, but it's fucking just no, you know what? No, like I don't. I'm not gonna bash Tetsuo at all during this. No, fuck you. What are you talking about? Yeah, no, Tetsuo. Is I mean, this movie amazing. has a greater influence yes. than Tetsuo. It has a greater reach. But like, Tetsuo is like a visceral experience. It it, it is hard to compare them. Um, you know where I was going with that? Yeah, it was the fact that I was deadly sick the day we did Tetsuo, so I was just like blacked out that episode from my mind. Yeah, if you go back and listen to that, I am in fact this is our 99th episode. Because we never did an episode on Tetsuo. Yeah, don't listen to that one. I was not feeling well that day, which is sucks because I love that movie so much. Yeah, that movie's amazing. That movie is like Eraserhead, but with pegging, <laughs> which I hope would excite most of our audience, especially the straight men listening to this. All you straight men. Listen. I hope none of our audience is straight. I'd be ashamed. No, it's okay to be straight, but listen, especially if you're it's a straight man. It's not okay man, to be super straight. <laughs> if you're a straight man, this is the thing, right? You're watching this movie, Yojimbo, with us. We're all looking for ways to enact our own version of heroic individualism in this era of, you know, late capitalism where it seems to have destroyed all our minds and crushed our spirits. Well, I want you to know, the heroic act that you can take is just agreeing to get pecked by your girlfriend the next time she asks. <laughs> just do it. You can do it. Don't be afraid. <laughs> oh, my God. Can I just say, as a bisexual dude, like, this whole, like, discourse that I see online of just, like, is it gay to get pegged? It's just, like, so far beyond anything I would ever think about. Like, it's fucking hilarious to what me. What do you mean? What does, that e- what does that question even mean? It doesn't matter. Like, the, the is it gay to questions in general have become sort of a joke just because, like, of how absurd they get. <laughs> yes. But. <gasps> Max St- Lakutas! It's Takashi Shimura. Ooh. Yes. If Tashira Mifune is Kurosawa's Max von Sydow, then Takashi Shimura is his Gunnar Bjornstrand. Make sense of that. No. Unfortunately, Takashi Shimura stopped showing up in Kurosawa's films around this point in time because he started to get very old and frail. Mm -hmm. And we'll see him in this movie. He starts to kind of look like a skeleton, which is sad. Um, But Takashi Shimura, obviously one of uh, the most important actors in Kurosawa's career. And the leader of the Seven Samurai. Uh, Another quality, quality film. Yes. In many ways, you might look at the Sanjuro character as a kind of evolution of the more, you know, youthful and and emotionally um, vulnerable sort of uh, character that Mifune played in Seven Samurai if he had not died. Sort of devolves into nihilism. Becomes very cruel. Oh, fucking pig boy. <laughs> Imagine this actor where it's just like, okay, you're going to play stupid pig boy. You're they're basically like, they're like, hey, you know, you know how you're ugly and you look like you'd be a fucking moron. Uh, no, they're like, something's missing from this outfit. We need to take inspiration from Groucho Marx. <laughs> just give him a comical unibrow. Look how fucking hilarious this is. They're just like awkwardly sitting there like, what, what do you want, dude? <laughs> The innkeeper is just like, this is so weird. What is happening? (laughs) If you watch this by yourself, you might not understand how funny this is until you watch it with an audience. And then you just realize how fucking deadpan all this shit is. Like even the fact of like how fucking like grotesque and ugly the pig boy is like (laughs) the movie isn't trying to make you laugh because he's grotesque and ugly, it's trying to make you laugh by the fact that they actually said, yeah, we're going to make him look like a pig boy. <laughs> what do you think of that? Do you know, do you understand the difference? Yeah. Like, <sighs> you know, it's really interesting to see this type of humor from a filmmaker in Japan, from Kurosawa's generation. 
and a filmmaker in Japan around this time in general. Um, like if I think of like Ozu or Mitsuguchi, they never made movies with like this sense of humor. No, like, and the the wonderful commentary track that we were watching beforehand pointed out that like this level of black humor was something just like unheard of in Japanese cinema at the time. And I can only imagine what it would have been like watching this when it first came out and just like seeing everybody's reaction to it. Yeah. I wonder if Japanese people would have found this funny. It's this weird movie where it's like for no one because it's like, there's so many cultural signifiers that I think make this movie a lot more rich. If you have an understanding of Japanese history and are tapped into that culture, which we are not, we're probably missing a lot of like little semiotic details that are little cues um, that tell us things about different characters in different situations. Um, but also the sense of humor is definitely something that I don't associate with Japanese filmmaking this time and definitely with the samurai genre. So it's like, I don't know what to make of it. Like the only other like movie that I kind of would associate this with off the top of my head from Japan in the sixties is something like death by hanging. Oh, poor Lurch. It's a great movie. <laughs> I can't believe they found Japanese Lurch and just <laughs> put him in a samurai outfit. He's got a big sword. Holy shit. He's got a big face. That was a real kind of sword they had back then, though. No dachi. They're fucking gigantic. Sorry, my weeb is showing. <laughs> well, I guess I also, I'm, I'm curious, like, what all the props might signify the reason why i'm sort of fixated on this has to do with the, like a lot of stuff that i'm going to butcher right now in 30 seconds relating to like roland bartes and like his book empire of signs japan empire of signs um and the way that like japan relies on nonverbal communication in a lot of different ways and, and kind of like a different sense of like communicative like convention outside of language um where different things like props and stuff like that takes on a different meaning than it does for us speaking English because we relate to our language differently. Just makes me wonder how many things I might be missing out on. I always think it's good to broaden your horizons. And although there's a, there's a hard times article that I've shared numerous times and I know it annoys you when I bring it up, but what um, the, 10 years later, Yojimbo is still the movie that I bring up casually in conversation to seem intelligent. But I think that is so funny to me because this is the kind of movie that like a Quentin Tarantino serviceable film bro could appreciate just on the fact that it's violent and funny. Sure. But there's so much more to it. But like the fact that somebody wouldn't bother to further analyze it or like go further into Japanese filmmaking culture and just like, Oh yeah, I saw Yojimbo once. I'm such a fucking intelligent <laughs> person. Like the that thing about that article me. is that it seems so weird to me because it's like this movie is like a broad comedy. Like, well, yeah, and that's part of the reason I find it so fucking funny. Yeah, it's and also like if you read the article, it's like him talking about like them making fun of like oh like the only movies I watched today are something with the Yes, ending suffix of man, but that's it. Still means that I'm I can appreciate high cinema because I saw this once in a college course. Yes. To be honest, Max, I feel like a lot of it, like I feel like a lot of people would not notice the humor in this because that's never something that people who are watching the film in that way and like the film through the film bro gaze, we'll call it. Humor is never something on their radar. This ah, is a pattern. I would disagree with that. No, they think shit like fucking uh, the Boondock Saints is funny. Well, not even just the Boondock Saints, but like um, I like Tarantino and shit like that. Like the the humor in Tarantino movies plays a sure, big part but, of that. Sure, but but I feel like that type like they don't watch movie they don't engage with movies in a way that seems like really like conscious to to me. Um, at least watching them in that way, like that's why I'm saying like if you're maybe struggling to grasp this movie, you might enjoy it more if you watched it in like a theater. I don't know when in, in what fucking future world that will ever happen. But if you did see this in a theater, I think you would grasp a lot more of the comedy because uh, you're, you're receiving it with an audience. If you're watching it with yourself. 
I can understand where if you're not as familiar with the samurai genre or like films from this time, like you might just not understand that certain things are presented as humorous, you know, might just because you just don't have the context for it. So here we have the coffin maker, the very funny joke. And again, one of those little elements of a uh, little uh, critique, critique of capitalism there, huh? uh, where the coffin maker has made his old business off of people dying, even though he's not the one killing people. Um, he's the uh, he's the pilot fish to the shark that is Sanjuro. He's going to pick up the scraps, m m eke out a living uh, on the side of the giant dangerous animal that is Sanjuro. Um, of course, later on in the film, his business will collapse because so many people will be dead. That nobody's bothering to bury the bodies. <laughs> yes, at home. they're just leaving them everywhere. I'm sorry, we just skipped over a very fucking funny line. Though, what? Of <laughs> a peace is only a <laughs> lead up to an even bloodier battle. There's nothing more dangerous than peace. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Which, one, you could look at that as him just like, lashing out in anger because he's might be out of a job if they really <laughs> yes. do make up he's not weirdly correct or you could kind of look at it as somebody who's experienced nothing but bloody battles his entire life and genuinely thinks that like peace only leads to worse battles well you know both what, of which are funny you know what the thing is about this movie though max oh my god never mind <laughs> shut up all the person i find attractive in this movie is talking oh you like tatsu and nakadai yes oh my god He's still live. Yes, you know, I was looking him up. He's still, he was in a movie, I believe, in 2019. Yeah, he's still making movies. Yeah. What the fuck? He's got to be in his mid to late 80s. Uh, yeah, no, god damn it. Like, yeah. And he would, uh, of course, team up again with both Chishiro Mifune in multiple films after this, um, including Sorry. The Just Amazing Samurai Rebellion and also uh, he Kurosawa. He such a perfect shit-eating grin. I would love it. <laughs> He's the perfect compliment in his performance to Mifune. People often talk about Mifune giving really big performances, um, but Mifune in this movie is very restrained in a lot of ways, and he, that is what assists his sarcasm and uh, how funny he is. But Nakadai is appropriately big for his role, and that helps him be really threatening. Um. And another interesting thing about his introduction is critics have pointed out how, like, you know, different characters are introduced alongside, like, different sort of elements. The thing with Nakadai is the wind is introduced, so he's kind of, like, crazy. He's flapping around all over the place, right? Um, other interesting details about Tatsuya Nakadai's character is uh, he's introduced in clothing that is distinctly different from a lot of the other people here. I think there's the... Imp the impression, also, given the fact that he has a fucking revolver, um, that he, more so than the other bandits here, is more in touch with, like, foreign influences. He he was... He's a more willingly colonized subject. Oh, well, the, this was, what, the Tokugawa period? That must have, like, he... He said he was traveling around Japan. So I believe... He, he probably... There was, like, two cities that were allowed to trade with the Dutch at this point. This is probably right around the time when uh, fucking what's his face Perry Matthew Perry yeah floated over. I find Matthew like it's so interesting because like I was watching a video, um, like Japanese people talking about their history and just like no, if you ask any like American student like about the history, nobody knows who the fuck Matthew Perry is, but like he is such a meteoric figure in Japanese history. Like everybody knows who the fuck Matthew Perry is. Because yeah, because he fucked with them. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody has seen that viral viral video of the history of Japan. <laughs> yeah, that's sure. Open up the country. Stop having it be closed. But that's literally what happens. <laughs> Just like you show up with like fucking yeah, gunboats that are so far beyond like anything that the Japanese can deal with. And it's just like, oh, fuck. Okay. <laughs> Japanese people are like, can we ask China for help? No, they hate us. <laughs> <laughs> they think we're idiots. Ooh, he's manipulating him. I love this. 
Yeah, I, I do wonder what part of the Tokugawa period this takes place. I, I think it's specifically vague. That's something that is appears in the David Desser book as well, where he talks about different subgenres of the samurai film. And he specifically refers to Yojimbo as what he calls a Shambara film or a sword film. And he points to Yojimbo as a point of origin for that subgenre of film, where there's a greater emphasis on the uh, sort of the act of violence itself. Well, and I, I don't want to sound condescending, but just in case a lot of our listeners don't know anything about Japanese history, um, the Tokugawa family were incredibly strict, in, incredibly traditionalist, and they for the majority of the Tokugawa period, completely shut off the country from the outside world. Nobody was allowed inside and nobody was allowed outside of it, except the Dutch, because the Dutch had established good trade relations. For some fucking reason. Well, that's one of the reasons that Matthew Perry uh, <laughs> fucking... Because he didn't like the Dutch? Well, no, because the Dutch, for a long period in history, basically won at capitalism. And for that, some reason. they Well, no, because they just took the Portuguese model of like becoming glorified pirates and f- establishing trading points across the entire uh, Silk Road on the ocean side, the Indian Ocean trade, and made it as far as Japan, and they were just better at it than the Portuguese were. <laughs> so they controlled those trade routes until England opened up new markets in different places and just overtook them. But that was one of the reasons. <laughs> it's just like the Dutch are the only ones with access to the Japanese market when we need to change that. So it's it's very interesting. Um, I find Dutch history pretty interesting as well because they just like, succeeded at capitalism for a long time and then just completely failed at it and now they just live on a country with flowers and marble everywhere cool oh god look at this fucking face the disgust on Tashiro Mifune's face yeah so funny this does play into sort of like the lone <laughs> male type is just like I'm above women I, I've conquered my carnal desires I don't need that anymore. but the interesting thing about this movie is that it never falls into all these traps like what you're saying because it, it recognizes how funny it is yes it's never misogynistic it's never just, no it's never done in a way of just like oh women are pathetic isn't it shitty how anybody could ever care about a woman women kind of don't exist in that way in Kurosawa cinema he only has one movie where there's a female lead. No regrets for our youth. That hmm. was in the mid forties. I haven't seen never that made one. another one after that where the woman was like in the lead. It does have important female characters, including the that woman, um, Orin, I think is her name in this. She's played by uh his lady Macbeth in Throne of Blood. Oh, okay. Yeah, so a lot of the actors in this are just like his stock actors that he would, you know, go back to time and again. Um, and I think she gives really good performance in this movie as she does in Throne of Blood. But, um, you know, despite the, like the importance of female characters to some of these stories, they're not about women at all. Um, they're very masculine stories. Yes, but and, and I don't want to kind of don't have opinions on women. Well, I don't want to come across as like dunking on Sergio Leone, but like those movies tend to do have like a, a slightly more misogynistic feel in their regards to women. But both of it like comparing it, it it was like you can draw interesting parallels of like a lot of prostitution in the the old west and like that was one of the ways that women could make a living and a lot of towns in the old west were established by like madams and prostitutes because that brought people there and brought communities there but it's i don't know it, it comes across differently in western cinema than it does in this well i i guess i guess part of the thing with that too is looking at the way in which um, society like codifies itself in the Western versus in this type of film. Where like, think about it, Max. In this time, this Tokugawa shogunate, what you were talking about where they were very strict and traditional. Yes. All that was like literally spelled out yeah. for the Japanese. They had the Bushido Code. They had Neo-Confucianism. They were like, it's not merely more rigid. It's that the fact that it's literally like spelled out social decorum that is like dictated and understood by people where it's like, these are the rules for decorum in Westerns. It's kind of like a a sort of films mythologizing the, um, these sort of like establishment of a new society or whatever that like, but it's something that happens like more improvisationally it's undergoing its creation. Whereas in these films, it's like the codes for how to exist and interact with each other exist yes and 
that is what guides a lot more of that like dichotomy too, um, where you know being right at the start of the Meiji, Meiji Restoration, that's part of why the contradictions that they're sort of mythologizing are so palpable is because like it's a real fucking shift when they start shifting into capitalism and everything, right? It's very different from the way it used to be. Oh, also that blood spurt yeah. is one of the biggest in this movie. Yes. Uh, one of the big moments. But of I, like, I love Unasuke just fucking everything up for his carefully laid plans. He's been playing these two people off each other perfectly the entire movie. Yes. And Unasuke just shows up and is just like, I'm just as a clever bastard as you are. <laughs> I can throw a wrench in your works too. It's not merely that he's clever. It's that he much like Sanjuro is kind of like above a, the codes. Yeah. He's absurdist. He's an absurdist individual. He's just on the flip side of it. Yes. He's perfectly at home in this evil environment because unlike Sanjuro, he takes more enjoyment in being fucking malicious. Well, Sanjuro, it, it's like Sanjuro has mastered the code so much that like it doesn't apply to him almost anymore. Whereas Unasuke is just like, I never had any regard for this bullshit. And like the fact that he's bringing a gun to a sword fight kind of demonstrates yeah. that very well. Well, what we're talking about right now, I think relates back to what Desser talks about in his um, definitions of the sort of samurai film subgenres. And I'm going to include all this in the show notes. Um, one of the things he talks about too is like this division in Japanese society between Giri and Ninjo, which he talks about basically being like the difference between like individualism and then like a duty to your sense of community whether that's like your family or, you know, your Lord or whatever it is. Right. So Geary and Ninjo as being one of the primary forces driving the, um, the, the sort of the dichotomy that like drives a lot of these samurai films. Right. It's like, how are these characters going to reconcile Geary versus Ninjo? And they do so often in violence. Right. So it's our responsibility to ourselves as individuals or to our community around us. Um, the thing that he sort of differentiates, though, between what he calls, like, the nostalgic samurai film, which I think is meant to be taken as, like, a standard for the genre, and the Chambara films, which are a deviation and which are inaugurated by Yojimbo, is the fact that these Chambara films do not give a fuck about <laughs> Kiri and Ninjo. They do not care. Yeah. Um, they're all about just the power of these individuals, and... In the more crass examples, it just becomes a display of violence. Um, that's why Yojimbo, more so than other previous samurai films, which had a little bit more prestige to them because they had the more traditional um, nostalgic samurai, samurai sort of angle. Um, that's why Yojimbo became the one to spawn so many B-movie ripoffs compared to the other ones because it has a more straightforward engagement with... Uh, it's historical sort of um, milieu. But again, it's it's a little bit deceptive because we say it's more straightforward, but the thing that differentiates this movie from a lot of its B-movie ripoffs and imitators is going to be its really palpable and interesting sense of humor, but also how that relates to its idea of politics. That's not something that I would expect from, you know, a lot of cheap B-movie ripoffs. No, honestly. I'm sorry. The the cinematography in this scene and the constant changing camera angles are very. This is day for night. Yeah, it looks great. You could get away with that better in black and white than you can now. Sure, but I mean, it still looks awesome though. Yeah, Kurosawa is just so good at just like just well, fundamentals. It gives the illusion of just like this huge moon in the sky illuminating this showdown, and it yeah. works very well. I mean, the aesthetics of this movie are. You're prepared for that because it's just very abstract in general. Kurosawa in this movie, um, I, I know everyone talks about how he uses like telephoto lenses and he's really gr great at that. But he also um, is very good at alternating between telephoto lenses and then having in some moments really fucking wide angles to like fit everything in the frame. And uh, it's really impressive how well he stitches those together because it basically just creates a lot of different like it's it just the way it abstracts the action makes it constantly like interesting to look at. Another trick he will do is he will have fake wide angle lenses where he, he, he will try to set up the scene with a, an idea of depth and kind of like 
not literal deep staging because it's not with like a wide angle lens, but he will have the telephoto lens and really focus on trying to artificially create a sense of depth by having people at different sort of layers, fo- different focal areas, right? Um, and again, it's just another way to keep things interesting because it's not a wide angle lens, but it's it's trying to behave like one, even though it's a telephoto lens. Another interesting thing that guides the camera work and just the, our visuals in this movie is that I think for almost every single scene, everything we witness is is like tied to the perception of Sanjuro. Yeah. In that scene where we think for a second we're seeing something that he's not present for, oh, it turns out he was watching from the tower the whole time. Well, yeah, it's almost like we're switching to an Asuke's uh, perspective because he's the new interesting character and yeah. he was just talked about of rewriting the second half of that story, that the drama that was brewing in the town. Yes, it's like, oh, is he going to interfere in terms of like being a new author? We yes. have the battle, yeah. But no, Sanjuro is still present. And even though the movie presents them as equals initially, it, it goes on to show that he was never quite on the same level as him. Sanjuro is going to get his ass kicked. Yes. He is going to... He has his yeah. humbling moment. He's not God. No. But... And part of his getting ass kicked, too, is kind of, a again, a self-aware acknowledgement on Kurosawa's part about the true nature of history and how this movie is kind of like just a, a fantasy, you know, with this really artificial Sanjuro character. Um, that's something we haven't talked about as much, the sort of Brechtian nature of the Sanjuro character and how deliberately artificial he is. The fact that he has no lineage. Um, and again, relating it more specifically to Japanese history, exactly what it means for him not to have a fucking name. Every samurai, their lineages were like yes, it deeply was, tracked and like connected. And Family name was incredibly important. Yeah, because you just, the status of samurai was not something you could like just fucking rise to. It was inherited. No. Um, so it was very important and, um, him sort of walking out of nowhere on a dusty road, it almost seems like the hand of God, Akura Kurosawa's hand just dropped him in the middle of this fucking road and he comes out of nowhere. So he's an abstraction of like a samurai hero. And, um, in that sense, he's very much like a fantasy character. And I forget the point I was trying to make with that. Yeah. I don't know. But the point is, he's... he's. There are too many good scenes in this movie. It yeah. distracts you from points you're trying to make, unfortunately. I guess the thing with just saying, like, him... Oh, I was going to make a point about him dying, right? Or getting the shit kicked out of him, right? There's sort of an acknowledgement, despite the fact that, you know, Sanjuro is kind of like the samurai superhero. Him getting the kick shit kicked out of him is like, yeah, these guys did lose, though. Yeah. You know? It doesn't matter how good you... like. And that's kind of not to keep hearkening back to my boyfriend, but like that's kind of what Unaseke is there to prove. It's just like, listen, man, you can be good with a sword and you might be able to be one guy with a pistol, but he represents the encroaching like obsoleteness of the samurai cast in general. Like, yeah, you can be great with a sword, but like if I buy three thugs and give them each a pistol, they're going to fucking beat you, man. You can only you'll get lucky once. Yeah. Yeah. And the only reason that he kind of survives the original beatdown is through almost interference on the part of Kurosawa. You know, or like Kurosawa, we're going to talk about it when that scene arrives, but again, it's very self-conscious. They literally carry him in a makeshift casket yeah. to, a, to a graveyard from which he is resurrected. It's almost like Kurosawa saying, I am magically resurrecting you because you're my hero and I'm deciding you're going to fucking destroy these people because I hate them. Oh my God, so much squabbling. I love this. Of just the fucking, like, our honor demands that we have to... (laughs) keep trying to intimidate the other one until one stands down but (laughs) But no one does anything yeah but it doesn't matter anymore because he's got a gun (laughs) now max we've seen the dissolution of this family right and how harmed this family is by everything um oh this is fascinating framing as well 
Um, but uh, I, w- I think one of the most interesting things about this movie that we probably will miss out on because we're not as well versed in neo-Confucianism and it's, again, very spelled out conventions for how family members are supposed to interact is how this movie sort of diagnoses um, one of the ills of capitalism being like the, the deformation of like subject relations under capitalism. Um, I don't think this movie is necessarily a Marxist critique, although it has Marxist elements and Kurosawa himself was a member of the Marxist party as a youth. Um, But I, I think that's one of the Marxist elements in this film is how it's, again, it's, it's sort of going after certain individuals, but I think the point of the movie is that if he just killed the guys who are in charge, that wouldn't really accomplish anything. Yeah, That's why he has to allow them to hang themselves and destroy one another. Um, because it's like the subject relations of different people under capitalism is the poison in this town that he's trying to root up. And it's interesting, too, that's, that's further emphasized by exactly how he manipulates these people. How does he do it, Max? He makes himself the most valuable commodity to them. He's using their relationship to the market and their like capitalist uh, subject relations against them so they will destroy themselves. Because he understands that like that type of relating to other people is inherently... Uh, toxic, and as long as he saw, has something they want, he can probably destroy them. <laughs> if he's got something they both need, he's got the upper hand, and there's nothing they can do about it. Yeah, but also we, that was the moment that we see that like he still has morals left. He's not just a <laughs> chaotic money maker at yes. this point. This yes. this was the moment where he's just like, okay, this is where the emotions of the movie start to get real for him. Yes, getting getting thugs killed in a pointless battle for honor and control of money is fine. I don't give a shit about that, but like you fucking kidnapped this guy's wife and gave him, gave her as a sex slave to a sake brewer so that you would get more power. That's fucking disgusting. (laughs) Yeah. And again, it's about like the, the, the family in Japan, the Japanese family has been mutilated in this way. Right. And now Sanjuro is kind of going to try to restore it. Of course, he's not going to be the straightforward like Avenger for this, you know, dead family ideal. Um, because even when they try to thank him for it, he starts to like insult them, <laughs> tell them to like shut the fuck up, or he'll kill them. Stop standing on ritual of just like, oh, we have to thank you with all of our heart now. Just fucking go. <laughs> yes. 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 Very interesting. And them feeling the need to thank him is what fucks him over <laughs> in the end. Yes. <laughs> It's very weird, isn't it? Him performing a self a selfless act in this world is what fucks him over. I think that's a deliberate point, though. Is like, you know, it doesn't stop him from doing that because he's a magical superhero and he can't die. But also, like, if he wasn't a magical superhero, he would have died. Yes. I think it's very <laughs> deliberately saying that, you know? God damn it, pig boy. You're so fucking weird. Oh, he's fun, though. The, even the way he, the actor does such a good job, the way he yes. walks, it's like, what the hell? What the hell is going on with this guy? Pig Boy is representation for us, I think. I gotta beat him up. <laughs> oh, he's so fun. He runs like a fucking goose. god can you imagine this guy like exploding into your apartment (laughs) i love this Mm. he's so easy to manipulate he tells this guy to go get help for the people that have been killed before he even bothers to kill them oh there you go oh this is by far the best fight scene in the movie Mifune, I mean, he's pushing 40 around when this movie comes out, but he's still so good at all the physical stuff. And that's something that I really love about the way Kurosawa films action in this movie is uh, he doesn't rely too much on editing. He he really focuses on staging his action scenes. It's not just this movie, but all his movies. 
it's why his action is so like kinetic and exciting is that he just like puts the sword in their hands and he it's not that he abdicates you know doing shit with his camera but he really focuses on staging the scene and then organizing his his camera work around that instead of uh the opposite which obviously is generally harder to do you need you know a little bit more patience a little bit more practice and a little bit more talent to be able to pull that off it is a shame that because i was doing research for this movie i I learned about the division that happened with them later on and it's like oh mifuni and uh kurosawa yeah. yeah and as much as I admire Kurosawa as an artist, it did seem more like a him problem <laughs> than a... It is unfortunate, that, but, you know, they did have a great collaboration yes. throughout their career. and it, it was great while it lasted. It have was... you seen many of the other movies he made with uh, uh, Mifuni during this time period? I mean, he would go on... What, what did he make after this? He made Sanjuro directly after this, but then he would go on to do High and Low, which is fucking amazing, High and Low. But then also his final movie with Mifune, Redbeard, is also fucking amazing. Yeah. I've seen Redbeard. I haven't seen the other one. but And, and of course, I've seen Seven Samurai, but that was before this. Yeah. Um, and it was ironically, because we were talking about, like, it was one of the roles that he did in the West that, like, <laughs> Kurosawa fucking hated a I believe it was that TV show that he was on consistently. What TV show? Uh, it was. What the fuck was it called? Oh, it was just a show in the eighties called Shogun. Um. That. It was all mini series, but uh, apparently that was very divisive, and Kurosawa didn't like the way it portrayed Japanese culture in the West. So that that was a driving point between them. Oh, he's killed all these people, and now they're finally showing up. Max, I want to ask you something, just based on the way Mifune has been filmed so far. How tall do you think he is? How tall? Uh. Yes. 5'8". Oh, nope. A little bit taller. Oh, really? Yep. Okay. I thought you were going to like spring some like, he's actually only 4'9". <laughs> this was amazing use of camera work. He's 5'9". Okay. I do think it's, you would not guess that. He seems huge in this. He is framed like larger than life, but like. But his performance, he just. Yeah. Seems like he's like 6'3 <laughs> in this movie. He has the confidence of a 6'3 person. Yeah. But to Shiro Mifune, short king, or average-sized king. Yeah, I wouldn't have guessed he's shorter than me, honestly. <laughs> that's, that's wild to think yeah, he does. Yeah, it is crazy. You never get it, but short is a state of mind, and he does not have it. I guessed 5'8", because I'm just like, well, he has to be shorter than I think he is. So <laughs> yes. <I'm> gonna... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I, I think that's just like, that's right, folks watching this. Really, like, it is all in the mind. Is all in the mind. If you just mentally, you know, mimic Toshiro Mifune, you'll be taller than you seem. Now, Max, another thing I wanted to talk about about this movie is it is its use of a plot device that is used in a lot of westerns as well. Um, the idea of like the lone gunman coming into a town, right? Yes. Um, and then working in with the Shambara film element of this, where again, the the samurai character is not as interested with like a sense of conviction or like, you know, the Bushido code, but oh, this, this is, is the comical. Most, this is the most terrifying scene in the Look at all movie that for sake. Austin. Oh my god. <laughs> Austin loves his sake and there's so much just everywhere. Yeah, just what a disaster. You get drunk just by running through there. Probably. You'd be sticky for days. Title of your sex tape. <laughs> exactly. We'll do a commentary on my uh, sex tape. Sticky for for our 200th episode. <laughs> Stay tuned, folks. Need to film the movie first, but... Yeah. That's our tier five uh, Patreon <laughs> supporter. You get early <laughs> access to Sticky yes. for Days. Yes. Our tier six is uh, you get to choose how we could die. 
Um, <laughs> yes. Did I mention already that I almost died? You mentioned it, but you didn't follow up on it, I don't think. I basically, I guess I accidentally poisoned myself. This was supposed to come out a week earlier, and it kind of got sidetracked by Austin nearly dying. Yeah. As far as I know, I nearly poisoned myself. Maybe someone was trying to stop me from recording. They this. saw that we were up to almost up to 100 episodes. I was like, I can't let them do it. We no. can't get to let them get that far. But anyway, the point I wanted to bring up, Max, was the lone gunman arriving in a town and then having the two forces battling in the town that the gunman then as an outsider begins to evaluate as an outsider and an ambassador for the audience at our entryway into the movie. They sort of evaluate everything for us. Also, I just want to say that I love those sweeping shots of the town now fucking destroyed. <laughs> it's so funny. And I love how like this was all caused because they stole the sex slave of an important businessman in the town who was making one of the rivals powerful. And it's just like that led to this fucking utter destruction of the town. Yeah. Well, they fucked with each other's commodities. Yeah. And then it was over. Can't do that. Um, But the point I had in in bringing up that sort of structure of the outside gunslinger coming in is when it places the two sort of conflicting groups on trial... It is forming, you know, something we talk about with that, like, classical dialectical storytelling, where it's like the ethos of each group is going to be tested against the other. The interesting thing about this movie, though, is that while it has that general sort of frame that it's using, it is not interested in a dialectical progression between either one of the gangs because they are identical. Yeah. It makes no difference. And that's why Sanjuro wants to destroy both of them. Because they are the same. It is not so much that this movie is evaluating the two different gangs. It's that it understands the capitalist system under which these two gangs relate to one another is the evil thing that must be destroyed along with them. So you can't simply allow one gang to win uh, because that would not bring peace. You know, like the like the uh, casket maker said... Um, a peace is just, you know, a war in waiting. Yeah. And <laughs> as he said, our protagonist, it's like there's nothing more dangerous than peace. <laughs> yes. But it's peace under this capitalist system because now we're just waiting for the next time somebody wants a thing that someone else has or they're in competition with one another and then blood is around the corner. You think they would have been suspicious of him earlier on? It's just like, we paid you 80 bajillion dollars. Why aren't you living in our like nice place <laughs> rather than... This shitty fucking sake shop. In the well, of Max, town. you'll see. Uh, there's a lot of bottles of empty sake. Yeah. So it looks like he's doing some real drinking. Warp, warp. God damn, Tatsuya Nakada is so freaky looking. I don't think he's blinked once in this scene. Yep, nope, he hasn't blinked. <laughs> it's so freaky. I mean, you wouldn't they didn't notice that the husband and kid were gone until now. <laughs> Nobody thought to check. Max, have you seen the town? A lot of shit's been going on. And then you have Pig Boy in charge. You fucking think he's paying attention to anything. He can't even open his eyes. (sighs) And it's funny because fucking Unosuke is the youngest brother. (laughs) He's the only one with any idea of what's going on. Yeah. Uh Uh-oh. Sanjuri, you're in trouble. You're in trouble! So Max, one oh, of the, this I'm sorry. This, what the the just casual tension building in this scene with like you didn't even need to have that cut to the note, but like that just one frame of just like asking for the sake bottle to be replaced and like trying to get that out of the frame because he knows it will fuck him over if he sees it, and it will fuck him over. Whoops! Whoops! Hmm. 
You oh. fucked. Don't eat it. <laughs> just straight up eats oh, it. And our protagonist has reached his lowest point. He's yes. getting the shit kicked out of him consistently by Lurch and his brother. Now, Max, I want to talk about, like, this movie's relationship to, like, the gangster film. Uh, I think it's interesting because this film... I, this film kind of like, I think it takes more from the gangster film than it does the Western, really. Even though there's a, there's a lot of individual elements we can compare to Western films. Well, I think the Western film takes a lot from this. It takes some elements from existing Westerns already, but I, I would agree with you. that yeah. it, From existing films at the time, gangster films were probably a bigger influence on this. Yeah, because I, I think that we've talked about in different gangster movies how the gangster character is sort of an evolution of the Western gunslinger in a more modern era after the frontier is closed down. We've talked about that a lot, actually. Um, we've talked about how the gangster is kind of like a Western gunslinger in a post Western world. Um, however, I think it's interesting to point out how like one of the things you'll notice if you read any sort of criticism about the gangster film and about this movie is that they talk about the shifting of different types of frontiers in these different genres in the Western, it's a very literal frontier. It's moving westward. Um, however, in the gangster film, as is the case with the Ojimbo, it's an economic frontier, right? The manifest destiny is like an economic ascendance. Yeah. In the gangster film. Um, whereas in this movie, it's kind of like a, it's not like a, so much a parody of that idea so much as it is like, inverting it where it's like oh it's not his economic ascendance it's like his like economic descendants where it's like not personally that he's losing money all this way but it's like oh the descendants comes in the fact that we're gonna fucking destroy this economic system that's starting to take hold here it's not going anywhere we're gonna fucking burn it to the ground and he doesn't and yeah, well, our protagonist doesn't give a shit about money the entire time. Yeah. He has 30 Rio, which is astronomical money for anybody else in this town. And he just fucking throws it to the fleeing family. Just like, here, take this. I stole it. I don't give a shit. Yeah. The money, again, it's not. The money is not part of this. He does have convictions. It's just not in tune with like normal morality or a normal sense of like honor, according to like the Bushido code. It's simply that he's like this absurdist character who's looking to destroy what he thinks is evil. That's what he's really compelled by. It's like if a gangster in a gangster film started to ascend the ranks of like the mafia or group he's part of with the explicit purpose of fucking murdering and destroying them. Perhaps like Miller's Crossing, another movie very closely related to uh, Red Harvest. But another way in which you can look at the gangster film as sort of, uh, I don't know, a transformation of that idea of the frontier is the fact how in, in many of those original wave of gangster films in the, in the 30s in the U.S., uh, the gangster protagonist, the hero, is often someone who's like a second generation uh, immigrant from a different country or someone who is like in, in some way like ambiguously like racialized. Even when it's in a racist depiction, those gangsters, the point of doing that is to depict them in a way where it's like, oh, they're coming from elsewhere and arriving in the U.S. So even still, they maintain a level of like the frontier only you're arriving in like an urban setting rather than um, being like a pioneer going through nature. And again, it's a similar thing here where it's like, oh, we're coming out of nature and we're going into this more urban setting. But it's not like the agrarian Japanese village um, you might associate with this time. It's a, it's a town that's becoming industrialized. You know, we're no longer concerned with simply farming for our own needs. We have industry here. We have sake. We have silk. They're competing for, with one another for the resources. And it's not just the resources. It's the markets and the prestige that comes with running said markets as well that they're competing for. The only reason that Unisuke 
or the three brothers in general are working so hard to get that woman is because she's the desire of the biggest capitalist in the village. Like, yeah. And I do think that's an interesting element of this as well, how it sort of has different tiers to the level of antagonism in this movie where it's like, oh, the the Yakuza type gangs. That's only the first level. Right. They're the most visible to us because they're the most explicitly antagonistic. But we know that they're working to meet the needs of the, you know, sake and silk traders. Yes. Right. So we know that they're equally responsible for everything bad happening in this town. And then, of course, the third layer would be just like the ambassador of the Shogun or whatever that it arrives to like just check up on them. That we barely even see because they're yeah. so far removed from our hero's perspective on the situation. Yeah. There's just no connection to the people or, you know, anyone living here by the official government. Like, business and the Yakuza have been allowed to just run rampant in this town. And all three levels of, like, governance from the blatantly unofficial in the Yakuza to then, like, the businesses with little, you know, ostensibly more prestige to the official government are all, like, woefully ineffective to combat the fact that they're now just living under a more capitalistic framework. Because they they would have to fight themselves, and they're not going to do that. Another really interesting detail in regards to that uh, that Stephen Prince points out in his commentary track is exactly how many different things were going on in Japan at this time um, that were like moments of national conversation and national protest um, in regards to not only like U.S. colonialism with the renewal of like um, the U.S. trade pact uh, that happened previously to this. Um, so the Japanese government basically agreed to allow the U.S. to exert its influence still after this, um, but also the way in which the government was becoming more industrialized on its own. Um, Stephen Prince talks about a lot of different examples of like land expropriation, um, which I got the impression was not something the Japanese government had done in that way previously, um, you know, where they expropriated a lot of like farmland from different people and just like took it and used it for different yeah. things. Um but also the emergence of the Yakuza in the post-war environment as, again, sort of like something we might compare to kind of like Pinkertons in U.S. history. Yeah, just... Pinkertons basically a gang, but they had a more like explicitly... Official sounding name. <laughs> not only that, but they had a more like explicitly political um, purpose. Pinkertons were the people, if you somehow don't know this, Pinkertons were the... They're kind of like just evil people you would hire um to resolve business disputes in horrifyingly violent ways so if you had people going on strike you would hire pinkertons to fuck with them and pinkertons would do anything they threaten i did find out they'd... a nice thing about the guy who founded the pinkertons recently oh yeah uh he tripped you know how he died wow he tripped and uh bit off his own tongue in a way that got infected and he just died that way <laughs> <laughs> like a little bitch like he deserves <laughs> Take that to. you fucker <laughs> was his name pinkerton uh why would you name them i've never understood that well that's like a language changes so fucking quickly especially english and like languages with an alphabet like you always see like those jokes going around on twitter where, like when they'll find like a comic image that's hilarious because like words that meant different things back then like the most famous thing is like the joker's boner if you've ever seen that <laughs> what you've never seen that no where it's just like a boner used to mean like a gaff or a screw up so there, like, there's a newspaper. It's just like Joker pops big bone <laughs> at local bank because he fucked up a robbery, and <laughs> it's just a Joker being like, "They want to see the Joker's boner. Huh? I'll show them how big a t of a boner the Joker can make." And it's just wow. like, wow, <laughs> words change really fucking quickly. The thing is, they're not mutually exclusive. He could have fucked up the robbery by just busting out his cock. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> Man was so hard, he forgot to rob the bank he was robbing. But again, he's the only one with an idea of what's going on. Tatsuya Nakadai. Yeah. So Tatsuya Nakadai would collaborate with Kurosawa in a number of different movies, but probably mo his most memorable collaboration is in Ron. Have you ever seen Ron? I have not. Ron is so fucking good. Cannot even describe it to you. The fact that Kurosawa made that movie while he was going blind... Is like 
disgusting. Whenever I hear stuff like that of like auteurs who like overcame this shit and like still made art pieces that will outshine people for centuries even i'm just like man fuck you stop being so talented yeah he did that while he was blind and his paintings from that period are also amazing um kurosawa's like last 15 years of his career are fucking fascinating again they're the most overlooked of his movies stuff like rhapsody in august and dreams and matadayo these movies are like fascinating people don't talk about these movies He's, this is what I'm saying when it's like we're still struggling to like catch up to Kurosawa. Even after all these years and after all the ink that's been spilled writing about his movies, we focus on his like samurai movies. And even within those, I think we still struggle to really elevate the conversation to the level of sophistication that these movies have to offer. But then we also just overlook all this late shit. It's like he didn't make a movie after Ron. But yeah, Tatsuya Nakadai is the King Lear character in Ron, oh, and he perfect. does an amazing job. I haven't seen that, but I already fucking love it. Yeah, he's uh, he definitely has a great face for it. As he aged, his face would sort of get a little bit more hollowed out and look a little bit more skeletal. Um, and he's really amazing in that role. It's part of why it's shocking to see him still working. Because well, it's no, like, I actually I looked into what his most recent film was, and he's playing in the movie, an elderly, uh, formerly great samurai actor who's past his prime and his family are trying to figure out what to do with him right mm. now. And it's, it, it's supposed to be pretty good from the few reviews I read. So I might have to check that out. I believe he also, I don't know about this. I believe he also recently collaborated with, uh, once again, with one of Kurosawa's assistant cameramen. So lots of people involved with Kurosawa still alive and kicking, making movies. It's a great thing. God damn it, pig boy. <laughs> Leave Inosuke alone, okay? <laughs> he didn't do anything He's got to have such a weird rash on his lip from fucking biting it so much. It's just making me think of that, like, Lin-Manuel Miranda thing where he's like, I'm horny again, biting his lip. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no. His bottom lip does look swollen. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> from biting it so often. He'd make the Kardashians jealous. I I was saying to Austin there where I'm like, I don't I don't think I know raccoon dogs and tanuki are native to Japan, but I don't think like regular raccoons are. So I'm wondering if that like in the original Japanese was like smoke them out like tanukis. And Wait a second. A raccoon dog and a tanuki are not the same thing. I be they're I believe they're the same thing. Um, I just wanted to clarify because I'm I'm like ninety percent sure, but I'm not one hundred percent, so I didn't want to um completely fuck over. But uh, I I was wondering if the original Japanese they was just tanuki and they're just like eh, raccoons. They'll know what they were talking about. So wait, would a raccoon dog be a dog that looks like a raccoon? Is that not what a tanuki is? A tanuki is not a dog. No, it, it is closer to a raccoon than anything. Can you have a pet tanuki? No. <laughs> okay. They do have very large nuts, though. That is that is the <laughs> thing. Okay. If no, because you'll see, like, uh, in front of a lot of Japanese, like, restaurants and businesses. Yeah, uh, they got the little tanukis. And if you look at any of those statues. Oh, they got big nuts? They have gigantic balls. Uh, <laughs> Holy shit. It's supposed to bring good fortune to have them. They're nuts? Or well, they're, the like, them in The particular. statues, yeah. Oh, okay. Not they're not specifically. No. <laughs> but them having gigantic balls is just a thing. You know who else has like gigantic balls? Bonobos. I love those guys. <laughs> I was thinking to just talk about our favorite animals for a while. Yeah. I've been really into cuttlefish S lately. Speaking of like Japanese things, like we're getting ready for Godzilla versus Kong here. Yeah. If you're listening to this in the future, I was just thinking how great it would be if you'd replace King Kong with a giant bonobo. <laughs> They're like dumb, fat ass bodies and like a stupid grin on its face. I am calling it now because like with every like big studio movie now, you have to ask what like the post credit or sequel bait thing is going to be. They're fighting Mechagodzilla. It's going to be Mechagodzilla. They're going to fight Mechagodzilla in the movie. You think so? Yeah. Then what what the fuck else are they going to fight? Oh, uh, what's going to be like the thing that, or 
Mecha Ghidorah is also a thing they could do. They're going to fight Destroya. Desos- I'm sorry, you're pronouncing it wrong. It's pronounced Desostroya. Desostroya. Yes, because they could not copyright Destroyer. Well, they mispronounced that <laughs> in the video game from 2002 Yeah. that I was obsessed with. Destroy All Monsters, great game. By the way, you have to bring that back, people who made that. I don't know what you're doing. You're sitting on a gold mine. What are you doing? It's that, yeah, and they made another very similar one for the Wii called Godzilla Unleashed that had even more fucking characters in it, which was great. But yeah, they don't make, like, goofy fucking kaiju brawlers anymore. Why not? It's All so- I want is, like, kaiju things. Stop also, fucking around. Also, I know the studios are rivals, but uh, we, we were... I've been on a big gamer kick recently, and I forced Austin into that recently. But Barugan, like, not Baragon. Yes. <laughs> I thought it was a crossover the first time we watched it, because it was the first Gamera movie I'd seen. And it was like, wait, what? This is Barugan? Yeah. Um, Barugan, to be fair, is a much better monster than Baragon. Um, Baragon has a good design. He's fine. He but, rolls around like a but, roly-poly. But he doesn't fucking shoot explosive rainbows out of his back. No, and, he's not a chameleon. And doesn't dissolve when he turns into wa- <laughs> it touches water for some reason. That was so crazy when we watched that because I had no idea that Gamera like, fucking flies through the air like a jet <laughs> boomerang. Yeah. I was like, what the hell is this thing with the flames coming out of it? It's like, oh, that's him? But what I was going to say is, I know the studios, like Toho and the studio that makes Gamera fucking hate each other, but like, can we please get over that and get a Godzilla versus Gamera movie Do already? Do they really hate each other? Yes. Fucking, the people who made Gamera, they're just sitting on it. They haven't made a Gamera movie in like 15 plus years. Yeah, and that's sad because like- and they missed the 60th anniversary. The 2000s Gamera movies are actually like pretty fun, good kaiju movies. You mean the 90s ones? No, there's once a couple in the 2000s No, as there's well. only one. Yeah. Okay, the series that went into the 2000s, rather. You said the one with the Attack of Legion is your favorite. Yes, of the new ones, yeah. Yeah. It's it's very good. I haven't seen those yet. Um, and obviously, we're going on a kaiju grading curve, but like, they're around the same quality as, if any of our listeners are like kaiju fans, it, it's around the same quality as like Godzilla Final Wars, which is considered to be one of the better Godzilla movies out there. So, you, For my money, my Godzilla movie that I grew up with, Godzilla 2000. Love that movie. It is great. Um, That's my favorite Godzilla design, too. Godzilla looks great. I think Orga is not one of the best villain kaiju. But See, I thought it was frightening, though. It was frightening, but it's like it's one of those designs that's hard to be memorable. Where it's like, like part of the, it's like the thing. Yeah, it's like Godzilla fights the thing. It's creepy. Keeps like sucking him off. Not in a good way, though. The, no, like the gigantic, like snake eating an egg thing that it was doing to Godzilla at yeah. one point. That was that as in, ingrained with my mind. Yeah, but, that's like, fucking freaky. But uh, if we're talking about kaiju, like the classic, like that's why Godzilla was so great because like fucking Rodan, King Ghidorah, Mothra, all just like very simple, very easy to recognize designs, and it works very well. And then Gamera is just like. Let's just attach bat wings to like a fucking knife. Gamera is just yeah, the prop department's field day was whatever the fucking monster of the week is. I'm sorry, but I didn't expect to be as annoyed now that we've gone off the rails. We're just talking about Gamera. I didn't expect to be as annoyed by like the friend to all children thing as I have been watching the last few of those. It's like, <laughs> I fucking get it. Stop. <laughs> he's Gamera. He's friend to all children. Though. And they dive into it immediately. Like there's the one where he's... Like, when he's fighting, like, Gauss or whatever, he's still being, like, a fucking catty piece of shit, and he's, like, (laughs) fucking with people and, like, blowing up cities. Then the very next one, it's, like, they begin with the theme song and a title credit that's, like, we'd like to thank the Boy Scouts of Japan. And it's, like, (laughs) oh, no. (laughs) Yeah, that one with, like, the tentacle aliens is, that's my, I don't like that one. That's my least favorite so far. Well, that that's the thing though. Like there are some high points in Gamera, but like there's a reason that it's known as like the B rank Godzilla. Yeah. <laughs> like the, a lot of the movies are very bad, <laughs> but there's a certain charm to that that I enjoy. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh, Max, Yojimbo. Yes, uh, Yojimbo versus Kong versus <laughs> Godzilla versus Whoa. Gamera versus Zatoichi. They did make a Yojimbo versus Zatoichi movie. Really? After this. Yeah, Yojimbo became, I think, the defining role of Toshiro Mifune's career. Um, and obviously, he's represented in like monumental, sort of iconic terms in this movie. Um, but he, it was followed up economically um, 
not only with the sequel, but like weird random appearances for Mifune where there's, there's a number of movies he shows up in where it's like, they don't call him Sanjuro, but he's technically a character with no name. So they just have to hint that it's the same guy. And it's like, yeah. oh my God, it's Sanjuro again. Oh, okay. That makes more sense. Yeah. Oh, they've brought him to the graveyard. Again, this is the scene where it's like, we, okay, we've had the comical interlude where they're carrying him through the fucking basket. He's like, I want to see the people fight and light everything on fire. And they're like, okay, we'll put the basket down in the middle of this carnage so you can watch. And then we get to watch because our, our eyes as an audience are tied to Sanjuro's. And now, since he's been really beaten, he's going to sort of have his um, resurrection moment. He's going to crawl out of the, the barrel. And then, interestingly, the movie is going to decide to have a transition where it's like he's spending a long-ass time in this fucking cabin. <laughs> of course, he looks like a ghost. He does look genuinely terrifying in that. Not going to lie. Yeah, it's the fact of his hair being down. It looks weird. That is part of it, but he's also incredibly pale. Yeah. Like, even for black and white, it's just like, ooh, ooh, okay. They did that very well. And it doesn't, like, because in a lot of black and white movies, like, you can tell when they caked makeup on somebody to make them look pale. Like, yeah, it looks very good. I think the thing with Kurosawa, even in his black and white films, is uh, he has this tremendous sense of color and, like, tone yes that's um, the word for it yeah um and again i think that's obviously displayed in his color films as well um almost all of his color films are like just really fascinating to look at he didn't make a color film until i think 1970 with dodes kadan and then um you know that was in the middle of like a dry period for him he did not make I think between 1965 and 1980, he only made like two movies. That was like the lowest point of his career, mm. which sucks because he, I would have been interested to see what he could have made in that like late 60s, 70s environment. I think a movie like this with its tone shows that he had his finger on the culture of like what was hot in Japan as much as anyone. I mean, not just in the fact that this movie inspired so many B-movies, but in the fact of its sense of humor, it's like, yeah, this does remind me of, like, fucking J Japanese New Wave. I do love how he was ready to go take on all of the men with that knife. Yes, <laughs> with, with, yes. With the line of, I'll make sashimi out of them. <laughs> yes. But goddamn, I love the way he strides up with his sword after that. Yeah. It's just, like, rendered in such heroic terms. Oh, this is the mock wide-angle lens, by the way. And it's done... So impeccably. It looks so fucking weird. It looks great, though. Yeah. One thing we haven't really talked about so far is the mayor. He's another example of the kind of, like, meta converse, like elements in this movie. Um, because he constantly goes back out into the street and he announces, like, it's almost like a scene change. He's like a referee. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> he's he does like a scene change thing he's a, he's narrating a scene change where he's like here's the time here's what uh, what's about to happen there's a fight that's about to happen look out and it's most absurd in scenes like this because it's like no one's fucking around anymore no it's it's no one lives here anymore they all left it almost reminds me like kabuki theater almost of yeah just like somebody just like this is what's happening in the play now Ooh, it's like almost lacking <laughs> like that sound effect that would make it that just whoa at yes. the end of everything i have alternatively heard um kurosawa cinema um either compared to the kabuki theater or the no theater i'm not enough of an expert on either one to really tell you <laughs> what like the specific qualities of each are and how they're different from one another but i think clearly one thing that defines both of them is their relationship to a sense of like artifice and its willingness to address the audience that's something we talked about um with the idea of the benchy as well uh in a lot of japanese art forms there is a they they have a different relationship to an idea of artificiality and how to relate to your audience where they seem to not be as worried about having like a direct like mimetic relationship to reality but they're comfortable um creating things that are elaborate and artistic and then you know drawing attention to that artifice what a great scene very patient 
of the patients is what fucking wigs out in a suke. It's like, I, I have a gun. <laughs> Why aren't you afraid of me? You don't need any dialogue. Just the score and the faces of the two actors. It's great. Yeah. And again, I think this is just another example of how this is a blatant uh, power fantasy. Because yeah. the gun, in reality, is the equalizer that will eliminate Mifune's talent. Yes. Because Mifune can't, can't beat him. But we have that, like, you know, magical element where he just gets him with the knife. Yeah. Just one time. Yep. One time the equalizer doesn't matter. His skill is enough to save the three people that are alive in this village. <laughs> And the movie comes full circle with this yes, farmer. With the character from the beginning. Yeah, the farmer who had fled his long life of eating gruel to try to make money in the city. Going back to the traditional ways that he had abandoned. For yeah. A quick profit. Oh. And my boyfriend is lying in a puddle of his own blood, unfortunately. And he wants to hold on to his gun. Like a Viking. So he can go to Valhalla or something. He can go to the other world with his gun. And it's completely not a cheap ploy to get his gun and try to shoot this guy. Listen, man, it's not that I want to shoot you, I promise, but, like, I just really like to hold my gun right now. I was, uh, I forgot to bring this up, but, um, it's not in this movie, but, um, it's in the sequel to this movie. That, uh... Sanjuro. Yes. That... A moment that echoed through, uh, anime culture... To this day, even where it's like you have the sword slash, and after like a beat, then the wound explodes in a huge fountain of blood. Yes, as if their blood pressure is eighty bajillion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but like the, the sword swing moving faster than the like even the human body can react with like the blood spurting out. Yes, that's a very common thing in anime, and it was in samurai movies for a while too. But uh. That was completely caused by an onset mistake, and I love that, that I found that out researching this movie. Was it supposed to explode like that? Yes, it was, um, they, they had done it before, and, like, it wasn't enough blood, so, like, they tried to add more pressure and more blood to it, but, like, that caused a backup in it, so that when they set it off, like, it just fucking, like, balled up, and then it fucking exploded, <laughs> So it was delayed, and the special effects guy apparently thought he was about to lose his job because, like, he fucked up while they were recording it. But the actor it happened to stayed in character, and Kurosawa apparently just looked over and gave him a nod of approval for how it turned out. So that trope ended up looking really fucking cool, and it was <laughs> completely accident. And, of course, that's something that begins in this movie, but, you know, Sanjuro, it, it's taken to a new level. And again, that's something that's characteristic of the Chambara film as a subgenre of the samurai film. Uh, compared to the rest, is a different emphasis in relationship to violence, a more nihilistic view of violence. And that, I know, is why uh, Kurosawa was kind of dismayed by the impact that this movie had um, being so popular and spawning so many imitators. I don't think he, he liked the way that all these knockoff Chambara films related to their violence. I think... He probably justified it in this movie because it serves a, a sort of lackly comedic and also political end. It's not just like, you know, pure gratuity. Um, I, I don't think he appreciated that as much. He, he didn't seem to like that. guy's completely gone off the rails and dude you're the mayor of nothing just relax you've got the day off now your town is destroyed
What do you think of the fact that the mayor fucking kills that guy? He's <laughs> not the mayor. That's the head of the... That's the sake and silk brewing guy who's completely lost his mind at this point because they said at the beginning of the film that he beats his prayer drum every day and hopes for the brother's victory. What? So... Where's the mayor? The mayor guy. Long gone. Oh, the mayor's behind him. Never mind. Yeah. That, that guy, he, he just killed the last of the three brothers for dragging him into this bullshit, <laughs> basically. He's completely lost his mind at this point. Yes. Yes, indeed. We know Sanjuro has be- become victorious because these people are fucking destroying one another. Yeah. And it's the, it's the subject relations under capitalism. That's what kills people in this. Yeah, because you're not reckless at all. You just fucking (laughs) fought eight guys and one guy with a gun. (laughs) But he's magical. He is. So he was always going to win. There he is. (laughs) Bro. Even after this incredibly somber battle, the movie decides to end on a joke. Because I think the thing that this movie is committed to is the fact that, like, one, the humor allows us to more freely engage in the mercilessly nihilistic fantasy this movie offers, where it's like, yeah, we do have to destroy the town. The sense of humor allows us to engage with that in a way that's less off-putting. If it didn't have that, it would just be kind of, like, dour. You, right, it would it would be too self serious and it would be too like ridiculous to take seriously. Yeah, um, it would be an edge lord thing instead of a thing that's like poking at you. It would just be like, are you taking me seriously yet or what? We gotta destroy the whole system, man. We it'd live, be like Fight Club. We live in a society. Yeah, it'd be <laughs> stupid. It would be dumb. Um, uh, but that's Yo Jimbo. Yeah. We did it. We did it. 100 uh, episodes, Austin. Yeah. And uh, what a great movie. There's still plenty left to be said about it, of course. Um, and maybe we'll have an opportunity to do Sanjuro as well. I would love that, honestly. Uh, needless to say, I hope we have many other samurai films we can do, uh, especially Samurai Rebellion. That's a great one we should do as well. And another time that uh, Nats- Tatsuyo Nakadai and uh, Jashiro Mifune team up. So if you're looking for more recommendations, there you go. You can check out Sanjuro or Samurai Rebellion as well. And if you want to hear us talk over more movies, you can find us at spectatorfilmpodcast.com. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify. Check out our YouTube channel if you like to listen to podcasts there and many other places. Um, Austin, any final words on this, our 100th episode? Uh, no, I don't know. No, not really. <laughs> if you want more engaging content like that, Here's to another 100 episodes, everyone. Goodbye. We're looking for a good porno to do, so send in your recommendations.